Pastor Dan, and welcome to Southminster Church's digital worship service for Sunday, August 30th, 2020. I'm uh, standing here today in a very special place, our new sanctuary that we are in the midst of construction on. And for those of you who are worshiping with us digitally, I want to give you a quick look at the, all that's happening here. Uh, it's just rain, so there's a lot of water right now, but you can see that the walls are starting to take shape and you can really get a sense of the, uh, the, the size and scale and uh, look of our new sanctuary. So it's getting exciting here. And I wanted to share that with you with some of you who maybe haven't been on campus in a little while. Um, this is our digital service. I wanna remind you that we are continuing to have uh, two on-campus services on most Sundays at 8.30 and 10 o'clock. There are three ways to participate. You can come and listen to FM 90.5 from your vehicle. You can come and sit in your car and roll down the windows and sit close enough to hear the PA system. Or if you'd uh, like, you can park your car and bring a chair or a blanket and join us on the lawn. We are asking all those that join us on the lawn if they would please uh, bring a mask and be sure to maintain social distance. But we would love to have you on campus. We will continue these digital worship services for the foreseeable future, um, but we do have have a couple things that I want to update you on. Uh, next Sunday, uh, September 6th, Labor Day weekend, we will have one on-campus service at 9 o'clock. Uh, next Sunday, that's one Sunday only, 9 o'clock, one on-campus service. Um, if We will still have our digital service, so if you're worshiping with us digitally, um, there won't be any disruption to your process, uh, but we will have one on-campus service on September 6th. Uh, just want to make sure that you're aware of that. The following Sunday, the 13th, is going to be uh, an exciting day. We're going to have communion for the first time in a long time. Uh, we were able to order and secure some little uh, single-serve communion cups. Uh, everything is uh, sealed in its own little packaging. Uh, you peel off the top and there's a little wafer. You peel off the next layer and it has the juice. Um, We'll be using that on campus. If you want to join us for communion digitally, uh, you can come to campus throughout the week and pick up those cups or use some bread and juice around the house. Either way will be fine, uh, but we're looking forward to having a service of communion on Sunday, September 16th. Additionally, we are continuing our church-wide study of 1 Peter, a book, a powerful book written to people who are going through a very challenging time in their lives. And Peter is writing to the early church and encouraging them the ways in which they can live out faithfully and be faithful expressions of the kingdom in a non-believing world, a world that's fallen apart and a world that is struggling. And so there are certainly parallels to uh, our time and, and the challenges we're facing and reminders about how we are called to live as God's people in a challenging time. So we would love for you to join us. That uh, wonderful teaching by Kyle Adelman is being sent out. The videos are being sent out on Tuesday. And then we have various small groups online and on campus throughout the week. We would love for you to watch those videos. And then we'd love for you to join us in one of our follow-up groups, either online or on campus throughout the week. Check your inbox Tuesday and uh, look for those that video and the invitation to join those groups. Uh, if you are not on our email distribution list and would like to be, please give us a call in the church office, 704-868-2914, 704-868-2914. We would greatly appreciate it. Hey, it's just a reminder, we are trying uh, to continue to uh, pay for the Joshua Initiative, the uh, four-year capital campaign and strategic plan in cash. Uh, we have not yet had to draw on our construction loan, which means less interest and less fees, and we'd love to do that as long as possible. Uh, everything that you've seen so far that has happened has been paid for in cash. We would love to continue that and pay as little fees and interest as possible. So we're asking you, if you are able at this time to make a contribution to the Joshua Initiative, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, there is a link in this email for ways that you can make a digital gift. Uh, certainly, you could also mail in contributions uh, or drop them off in the church office. Brenda Baker, our financial secretary, is in her office on Tuesdays. Uh, any of those ways that you would be able to support us, we would greatly appreciate. Uh, but friends, today we are here for worship. And um, excited to continue our series talking about the will of God. So let me draw our hearts and minds to worship with these words from Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. 
It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord and praise his name. For the Lord is good, his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's praise the Lord. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks for the gift of this day and the gift of these folks who are gathered in this unique way, in this unique time. But God, as we are gathered, two or more are here in your name. We are coming together in your name. We may not be in the same place physically, but we are in the same place spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. And we know that you are joining us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the uh, opportunity of this time, for the provision, and for the chance to be gathered as your people and come together for worship. And so, Lord, as we're gathered for worship, we just pray your blessing upon us. Thank you for this day, for life and breath in our lungs, for stirring us, for giving us the, the courage and the conviction and the commitment to be gathered here for digital worship. And I just pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters who are joining us. I pray that any potential distractions that might, uh, that might call out to them during this time of worship, that you would just put them aside and help them to be engaged uh, with your will and your word and your wisdom. And may all that's done here be good and pleasing in your sight for we pray these things in the powerful and mighty name of our lord and savior jesus christ for it's in his name that we are gathered here today and it's in his name that we come together in praise and worship amen friends welcome to worship As we gather for our conversation and study of God's Word, I want to remind you that for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the will of God and what exactly that means. And let me give you uh, just a refresher, a reminder of what we're talking about when we talk about the will of God. The will of God would be the way God desires things to work out, God's plan, God's desired objective. Uh, now, not everything works according to God's will and God's plan. And with God being an omnipotent, omniscient, sovereign being, we might ask, well, why not? Why doesn't everything work out according to God's will? Uh, why doesn't God just make everything happen the right way? And we've talked about this the last couple of weeks, but uh, I have a, a more recent illustration. Uh, Sarah and I are working through a, a bathroom remodel. Uh, we had another little minor flood in our uh, upstairs bathroom and we're working through a remo remodel and um, if you're married maybe you've been in a situation like this but we've realized that in this process Sarah has a will right she has a, a vision and an idea and a concept of how we should remodel our bathroom I have a will a, a vision an idea a concept of how we should model our remodel our bathroom or or what uh, we should spend and what finishes we should pick and um, all of those decisions and Sarah hasn't forced her will and said, Hey, we've got to do it this way. And I haven't forced my will. Um, this is saying, this is how it has to be done because we love each other and we are in relationship with each other. And we want to, we want to remain in relationship with each other, healthy relationship with each other. We give each other freedom. So we don't force our own way and our own will. Uh, we, we love each other. We want to stay in good relationship. We want to honor each other. And so we collaborate. We, we give. We give each other, the people we love, freedom. 
And the same way God does too. God could, God has the power and capacity. God is the only being in existence that has the capacity and the power to impose God's will on every aspect of life and existence. But God doesn't do that. Because God loves us, because God is in relationship with us, because God wants to remain in relationship with us, God does not force his will. But yet God still has a right and true perspective and desire and will and plan for how everything should work out. And so we as Christians have been asking the question, knowing that God has that right and true and perfect approach, the best idea at all times in every circumstance and situation, the best way to approach any uh, conflict or challenge or issue we're facing, we've been talking about what does it mean for us to seek that will, to seek that insight and that understanding. As Christians, this should be a part of our life at all times, but uh, it feels especially important or uh, the need is more pronounced during times of hardship and crisis. We tend to wonder, what is God up to? Why, uh, why is God not imposing more of God's will on this situation to fix things, to make things better? Um, and so we've been having those conversations over the last few weeks. And the first thing we've talked about is that we need to surrender to God. We need to legitimately seek God's will. We need to believe that God's will and God's plan and God's idea is better than our own and not be deceived as Jacob was in the story of him wrestling with God, not be deceived that we're on equal footing, that our strength and our capacity and our understanding is equal to or almost equal to God. So we are just as capable of making our own decisions and, and so therefore we wrestle to make our own decisions, go our own way, and we refuse to surrender to God. So we talked about the first importance of surrendering. Last week we talked about the importance of being steadfast, and we'll touch base on that in just a minute. But being steadfast, trusting God despite our circumstance. When our circumstance does not look the way we desire it to look, do we still trust God? Do we still trust that God is good? God is powerful, God is in control, and God can fix anything. And do we believe that no matter what? So we've talked about being steadfast, trusting in the Lord at all times. Well, I want to pick up on that because last week we talked about one of my favorite portions of Scripture, a very well-known passage of Scripture. It comes from Jeremiah 29. Uh, we read 10 through 14. Let me remind you what those verses say. It says, This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and I will fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Okay, this place that God's talking about is a promised land. It was God's will for the people. So for 70, for 70 years, when 70 years in Babylon are over, I will bring you back to the promised land. That's what God is saying to the people here. And then we have this verse that we love. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, uh, plans to prosper you, plans not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a good future. God has a, a good plan. God's will for us is a good will. It is, God desires uh, for us to be blessed. And so we, we see that in God's plans and purposes. He says, then I will call on you, verse 12, um, in, in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out from the nations where I have sent you and bring you home again to your own land. So here's the, the beauty of this promise. We see God's will. We see what God will do. Um, in, in this circumstance and in this situation. And just as we uh, discussed last week, we rem are reminded uh, that God's will for us is ultimately good. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. I, God is claiming, this is my will. This is my plan for you. And it's a good plan. It is a plan to bless you. In fact, uh, we see throughout Scripture that ultimately God's plan is to bless us as his people in relationship with him. The greatest uh, example of this is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that God gave his one and only son. God loves us so much. Jesus loves us so much that his will was to lay down his own life to save us, to rescue us, to redeem us, to bring us out 
of spiritual exile and into the eternal promised land. And so we see throughout scripture that ultimately God's will is a good thing. God wants good for our lives. But as we talked about earlier, and as we remind ourselves, God does allow realm room and for the realm of our freedom for us to make our own decisions. And sometimes we make poor decisions and we have to live with those consequences. There are consequences for our actions. We talked a little bit last week about how important it is for there to be consequences when we use our freedom poorly. Consequences are a, a form of order, right? You make the right choice, there's something good. You make the wrong choice, there's something negative. Uh, there's order in the universe. And if we start to eliminate consequences for negative uh, actions, all of a sudden we unravel into chaos. Uh, and, and there is no order. And trust me, we want order. Our spirits, our minds, our emotions, uh, we need order. Otherwise, we really become unraveled and it leads to a lot of spiritual, emotional, mental uh, distress. And so we need order. So we see in Jeremiah 29, 11, that ultimately God wants something good for us. But then there are times that are not so good. Jeremiah 29, 10. Uh, it's, when 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will come and fulfill my promise to you. Um, basically, God's saying, you know, my plan for you ultimately is good, but in this moment, not now, 70 years in exile come first, and that is not good. Um, again, we experience the consequences for our freedom. Israel had turned their back on God. They had rejected God. They had turned away, said, we don't want you. We want our own kings. We want our own gods. We want to do our own thing. Uh, and so they were experiencing the consequence of that. The Babylonians, after the Assyrians, were a form of consequence. They had turned from God. They had removed themselves from covenant relationship with God, which was part of the covenantal protection, that they would not experience things like uh, conquer and exile from the Assyrians, from the Babylonians, uh, from future empires, but they had made poor choices and they were experiencing uh, the, the consequence of it. Um, and so we see this throughout scripture. Um, we see in the New Testament that there is a consequence for our poor choices. When we use our freedom to sin, there is a consequence. Uh, we see the fullness of God's love for us that in the New Testament, Christ pays the consequence for our sin. He pays the penalty for our sin. Otherwise, the consequence for our sin is eternal death. Now the promise we have is eternal life, God's good will. That's how much God loves us. He moves in. That's how much he wills good things for us. He is willing to give himself. God incarnate, Christ came to give himself, to lay down his own life to save us from our sin. And so we see all of these things coming together here in Scripture, that God ultimately wants good for us. There are consequences for our poor, cho poor choices and, and our poor use of freedom, but God loves us so much, he even comes to pay the consequence. So when we realize in life that you know we're kind of off track, right? We're, we're, uh, we're experiencing consequence. Life is not the way we believe God desires us to live. We are. We feel like we are not in God's will. We are struggling and experiencing challenges, is challenges and setbacks. Uh, what do we do? Well, God could not be any more clear about what we are to do when we find ourselves in seasons of struggle. In fact, he he outlines it. You know, God says, "Hey, ultimately." My will, my plan, my good plan for you is to come back to the promised land. You're going to be in Babylon for 70 years first, but how do we get from that off-track place back to God's plan, back to God's goodness, back to God's provision? Well, he, I mean, lines it up perfectly for us. Uh, he tells us right here, Then you will call on me, and you will come and pray to me, and you will listen to me, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. My purposes, my plan, my will will be found when you seek. 
Okay, again, so this is a, a dependent clause here. <laughs> God's saying, if you seek, you will find. You seek me, you will find me. I'm not going to, God says, I'm not going to hide from you. If you seek me, you will find me, and I will bring you back from captivity. So here's our key for this week, right? We've had surrender. We've had steadfast. Now we're moving on to seek. Yes, they all start with S. It's a as a memory hook and a memory tool for you as we go through this series. Surrender, be steadfast, seek. Seek the Lord. If we want to get back on track, God gives us the key. Seek the Lord. If you remember the first uh, week in this series, we talked about, you know, if you were trying to get from, uh, from Gastonia to Vancouver, and, you know, there's a thousand different ways that you could theoretically get there, a thousand different combinations of roads you could take and, and different routes you could take that would ultimately get you to Vancouver. Now there's that one ideal path, the, the most efficient, the safest, whatever uh, route to get from here to Vancouver. Even though there's thousands of choices and combinations of ways you could get there, there's that one best way. And we uh, made the analogy that that one best way is God's will. And our freedom is often expressed in all the thousands of variations and ways we can get off track, we could get lost. Well, if we go back to that illustration, we ask ourselves, what, what if we were doing that? What if we uh, were on our way, right, and, and we realized somewhere along the way we were lost, right? We were not experiencing the good things that we thought were going to happen. We were not experiencing uh, uh, God's will. And we could just feel it in our soul that we were off track, we were lost, we were not on that direct path. Well, what would you do if you were on a journey and you realized you were lost and you were off course? Would you just pull over to the side of the road and, and wait and just recognize, well, we're lost? Would you get on social media and uh, you know bemoan your lostness and think somehow that just complaining and grumbling about your lostness, or if you were with a group of people, the, the collective lostness of those fellow travelers and, and think that somehow just bemoaning it out loud in public would, would get you back on track? No, we recognize that you know just pulling over and stopping, being apathetic in our lostness, or grumbling and bemoaning our lostness, none of those things are going to fix our lostness. If we want to get back on track, what do we need to do? We need to seek the right path, right? Whether that is getting out a map or plugging in the coordinates to your phone or talking to someone who has been on that route. You know, if there's a truck driver that has a route from Gastonia to Vancouver and drives it every week. I mean, <laughs> there, there is someone who can get you back on track. We would seek how to get back on track. And so that's the key this week. How do we seek God's will? God says, when you seek me, when you look for me, you'll find me. I'm not going to hide from you. I, have, I want good things from you. I give you realms for freedom. If you use your freedom poorly, you experience those consequences. But God is like, I'm not playing some cosmic uh, bait and switch where, you know what, hey, uh, you, you didn't choose me, so I'm going to pull my will out from under you, pull my goodness out from under you, and you're on your own. God is enduring in love and grace. And when we seek God's will over our, our foolishness, God says, you'll find it. You will find your way back to that good thing that I had intended for you. Providentially, last Sunday, I was talking to Keith Berry and, uh, after worship, and he said, you know, we've been talking about the will of God. We've talked about the uh, decreative will of God. When God makes decrees, let there be light. There are they are demonstrations of God's omnipotence, that God is all-powerful, that God can make a decree and nothing can stop it. Um, and we've been talking about God's declarative will, demonstrations of God's omniscience, that God knows all things. And so God tells us ways to be faithful husbands and wives, faithful parents, faithful friends and neighbors, faithful followers, and, and how to live in relationship and obedience, how to uh, you know, uh, align our finances and our time and our energy and Sabbath. You know, God gives us all this wisdom out of, as declarations of his knowledge to how we function best, just like a, a manufacturer 
gives you a, uh, a, a, a booklet, an owner's manual on how your appliance or your vehicle or whatever it is will function to the utmost capacity. God, our manufacturer, our creator, tells us right here in his word. Here's how you function most effectively. They are declarations of wisdom. And so we've been talking about that the last couple of weeks, but uh, Keith Berry was saying, hey, you know what? You preached a sermon a couple years ago, and there were more than three or two wills of God, and, and, and it wasn't the, the creative and declarative. And so I went back and, and did some research and couldn't remember off the top of my head exactly what he was talking about, uh, but looked it up. And, you know, providentially, as the Holy Spirit moves, it is perfectly in line uh, with what we're talking about. And so let me, as a way of review and kind of wrapping up here, uh, uh, bringing us to a conclusion, uh, remind us of what we talked about uh, in that sermon and, and uh, as we seek to continue to understand the will of God. There were three that I talked about, and uh, here's the first one. The providential will of God. This is almost synonymous with what we've talked about the last couple of weeks is the decreative will of God. These are the things that God is going to do uh, no matter what. These are God's prerogatives. We don't have to pray for it to happen. We don't have to hope for it to happen. Uh, we don't have to look for it. God is going to do this because it is God's desire. It is God's uh purpose. Uh, it's God's providential will. These things are going to come about. Again, it's very synonymous with the decreative will. Uh, creation is a is is the clearest example of that. You know, let there be light, there was light. There were no humans around to pray for light, to hope for light, to desire light, to want light to come. Uh, it is what God is going to do. Um, but it doesn't just stop at creation. Uh, Christ comes, the incarnation, right? Uh, God decides to become incarnate. The Father, Son, and Spirit decide this is how to save humanity, to restore uh, humanity to eternal and right relationship with God in paradise. This is the plan, and this is what we're going to do. And Jesus comes into the world. Uh, nobody could stop it. No, nobody uh, needed to make that happen. It happened outside of human will. Um, the Holy Spirit comes rushing at Pentecost, right? Like a like a mighty rushing wind. Uh, you know, people were desiring for God, but they didn't make it happen. They didn't bring it about. It was the will of God. This is the providential will of God. These are the things that God is going to do, regardless of human activity. Um, God doesn't need for us to uh, be faithful in our freedom to bring these things about. These are the things that God executes and God does because they are necessary and they have to be done. They are imperatives. Um, now, at the same time, while it is not dependent on a right use and exercise of human freedom, um, humans get to be a part of it, right? Uh, Abraham, God was going to create a, a great nation. Abraham was given the privilege of fathering that great nation, um, being the, the first in line in that great nation. Uh, Mary, Jesus was coming incarnate. Mary was given the opportunity to be a part of that, to experience that. Uh, people like the apostles, um, Paul, for example, the gospel was going to go to the Gentiles. Uh, Paul got to take it to them, be the, the, the one who was designated to take it to them. Uh, and so when we talk about the providential will of God, again, almost directly synonymous with what we've called the decreative will of God the last couple of weeks. When we talked about the, the providential will of God, um, these are things God is going to do. And we as believers, followers of Christ, the more we understand who God is, and the more we understand God's desires and God's agenda and what God wants to accomplish, uh, the easier it's going to be for us to see and understand God's providential will. Uh, we understand that it's going to happen whether we sign off on it or not. It's not dependent on our freedom, but we can, uh, the more we know God, seek God, and seek God's character, and understand who God is and what God desires, the easier it'll be for us to see 
God's providential will in action. So that's the first one, providential will. The moral will of God. If we were to take the declarative will of God and break it into two categories, universal application and personal application, the moral will of God would be the universal application of God's declarations. This is how God calls all of creation to live. And quite frankly, if all of humanity were completely subjective and submitted uh, and obedient to the moral will of God, then all the world would be at peace. There would be total peace on earth. Uh, the moral will of God includes things that God tells us very clearly to do, like you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not lie. Um, you, know, you know, we don't have to pray about it. We don't have to wonder about it and question it. Um, you know, there's no gray areas in, in God's absolute moral will. We don't have to think, well, what if I steal from the rich to give to the poor? Um, you know, those kind of things. There's no gray area. If, if all of humanity was fully submitted to the moral will of God, then there would be peace on earth. Um, these are things that we create questions about uh, just out of our own personal desires. You know, things like, well, maybe God doesn't really mean that I have to obey Sabbath, that I have to be intentional about times of rest and restoration and worship and renewal. Uh, maybe that's just a suggestion and not necessarily a commandment, even though it's one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, or does God really intend for me to tithe a full 10%? And I know it always gets a little sticky when the pastor starts talking about money and you think, oh, well, this is the point of the whole sermon. No, but it is also our money becomes... Uh, is one of the easier ways for us to create an idol and something we put our trust in uh, outside of God's power and strength. And so we all try to create ways to, uh, you know, explain away how we can use our money in our own ways and our resources in our own ways. And so it's just one of the great temptations and traps that we need to be honest about. And one of those things is saying, well, maybe God doesn't really mean that I should give 10% of my uh, income back to the Lord and to the work of his kingdom. Uh, these are things that we create questions about. You know, uh, is, it, is it okay to uh, kill someone in self-defense? And, and, and I understand it gets complicated. The reality is if the whole world were completely submitted to the moral will of God, it would not create those uh, circumstances where we have to question if something is justified. Um, if we were completely submitted to the moral will of God, we would live in peace. Um, we would know God's, we would experience God's providential will. That's the unique aspect of this. If we were submitted to the moral will of God, we would fully experience God's providential will. We would experience peace and paradise. Uh, so the second thing we talk about is the moral will of God. How God tells humanity to live universally, the universal application of God's declarations, God's wisdom for our lives. Finally, the personal will of God. This is probably what most of us think about when we talk about experiencing the will of God or finding the will of God in our lives. Um, this would be part B of God's declarative will. If the moral will of God is the universal approach to how God desires us to live as a created people, the personal will of God is God's plans and purposes for our life. This is where we get into the importance of discernment. What is God's wisdom for my life? Should I marry that person? Should I get that degree? Should I start that business? Should I um, you know, reconcile with my siblings? Should I, uh, you know, all of these, should I move to Atlanta? All these all these things that we wrestle with and we wonder about, you know, is this God's will? Is this God's best for me? Um, fall under this second part, God's declarative will um, for us personally or God's personal will, God's will for our lives, God's plans and purposes for us. And this is where this week's key really comes in. When we have questions, do we seek the word of the Lord? You know, when I, when I ask myself, should I marry that person? Should I take that job? Should I, am I seeking God's wisdom? Am I just thinking about worldly, um, 
you know, reason, rationale for, for making the decision? Or am I opening God's word? Am I doing good, deep, rich biblical study? Am I consulting with spiritual mentors, uh, pastors, elders, friends, uh, uh, folks who can ad advise me and, and point out uh, God's wisdom for me? Or am I just, you know, using totally worldly parameters to make these decisions and make these uh, critical ideas and, and, and uh, exercise my freedom. This is where we get to exercise our personal freedom well or poorly. And it will lead to God's best for us or it will lead to consequences. And the difference is that seeking. Are we seeking the Lord? This is why Israel went into exile for 70 years. They lost the promised land, what God had intended for them, because they were using their collective will poorly. And here's the big idea. Here's what ties all of this together. The reason that we spent some time talking about the three of these and, and how I see it really falling into this concept of uh, seeking the Lord. The more familiar we are with the providential will of God, you know, what God desires, what God is up to, what are God's objectives, the more familiar we are with God's providential will, and the more obedient we are to God's moral will, the easier it will be for us to experience and see God's personal will. What does God want for my life? We can't be totally unfamiliar with who God is and God's character, and we can't be living, you know, entrenched in sin and, you know, totally in objection to God's moral will, and then somehow think that, you know, magically, we're just going to experience the goodness of God's personal will, that all of God's desires for our life are going to come to fruition just because. And so these first two steps are imperative. If we want to experience the personal will of God in our lives, we've got to become familiar with the providential will of God. Who is God? What does God desire? Why did God create? Why did God create the heavens and the earth? Why did God create us? Why did Jesus come? Why will Jesus come back? Why did the Holy Spirit come? What does the Holy Spirit do? All of these things we need to be answering and understanding the providential will of God. Who is God? What are God's desires? What are God's objectives? What are God's big ideas? What does God want to accomplish? So we need to be familiar with the providential will of God. And therefore, the more surrendered we come to the moral will, if we know that God is good, it is easier to live according to God's guidance. And the more surrendered we are to the moral will of God, you know, the more we are examining our life and you know, thinking about the guardrails that God provides. You know, God doesn't just give us God's moral will to ruin our fun. God gives us moral guardrails, just as we see on a, a coastal highway where you're driving along and there's a guardrail and then there's a steep drop-off that is dangerous. You know, those provisions, that guidance that God gives us in his word are those guardrails that keep us from those pitfalls, those dangers that we don't fully understand. And so the more submitted we are to knowing uh, God's moral guidance and the more submitted we are to God's moral will, uh, we put those things together and it will be easier for us to experience the personal will of God. If we know who God is, God's providential will, if we know what God desires, if we know what God's objectives are, if we live according to God's moral will, if we are living righteous lives, if we are examining ourselves, if we are taking out the junk that doesn't need to be in our life, the easier it will be for us to experience God's personal will, God's best for us, God's desires for our life. And all of this leads us to our focus for today, to seek, to seek the Lord. We will not understand God's purposes, God's providential will, if we're not seeking God, if we're not students of God's word. We will not uh, live in obedience to God's moral will if we're not seeking the Lord, if we're not looking at the ways in which God has called us to live. And, you know, not just the, oh, I know I shouldn't uh, lie and I shouldn't kill and uh, steal and all that. But if we're, if we're looking in, God's word tells us how to eat. You know, what is a, a right and, and wise diet? How to use our money, how to use our time, our energy, 
Uh, all of these things are in God's word, but we need to seek it. And then when we're seeking and understanding the providential will of God, the moral will of God, we will indeed experience the personal will of God. And we will be at peace. Despite our circumstance, we will be at peace with God and with ourselves, with our loved ones, and with our lives. Amen. Now, friends, as we go forward, may we go forward as a seeking people, people who seek him. You know, if we were experiencing lostness in any other form of life, in our relationships, in our occupation, in our finances, we wouldn't just pull over the side of the road. We wouldn't just bemoan and grumble about our situation. We would seek resolution. So as we go through times of wondering and wandering, confusion or frustration, as we go through our everyday normal life, may we be a people who seek the Lord, who seek to understand the world and our lives from God's perspective and seek the moral will of God and seek God's personal will, God's best for us. And as you go forward seeking him, May the grace, mercy, and peace which comes from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one of you this day and every day forevermore. Amen. Grace and peace, brothers and sisters. Have a great week.